Bueno, empezó la fiesta. ¡Huepa! <risa> <risa> Mi mesa favorita por el momento. <risa> bueno, pues, hola, hi everyone, my name is Wilmaris Rivera Soto, like um, Jessica introduced. To tell you a little bit about myself, I'm a business and technology delivery analyst at Accenture, which is our technology consulting company. Um, so to tell you a little bit about me, I, my passions are technology, being a woman in tech, and also inclusion and diversity. I am also the Hispanic American resource lead for the Accenture Boston community. Um, so that is a role that I'm really passionate about, um, you know, moving from Puerto Rico to Boston to kind of like see a new place and I was like, hey, where are the Hispanics here? I want to speak Spanish and from time to time. And it's really allowed me, um, you know, to do that, to bring people together from the Hispanic community and also others that are not from the Hispanic community but want to know about us, want to know about our culture and our amazing people, of course. And, and it's super happy to be here because thanks for those opportunities and, you know, saying yes to a lot of stuff like I did to Jessica. Este, I am here, and it's going to be amazing, and I am super honored to be here uh, with this amazing lady. Like Jessica said, this is part of the Words of Wisdom series, and we have an amazing leader. The purpose is to connect you and other amazing leaders with young professionals like yourself and like myself. Uh, so super happy to be here. Uh, so here we have, just to say it again, Jessica, a little bit more pronounced. <laughs> Vanessa Calderón Rosado. Gracias. Gracias. Buenas noches. Good evening, everyone. Awesome. So to tell you a little bit about Vanessa, Vanessa is the CEO of Inquilinos Boricuas en Acción, which I'm super proud of you already for doing an amazing work. Uh, they focus on delivering, engaging, and focusing on, you know, house opportunities for those that need it, education opportunities, and also um, art programs, which is amazing for, for the community of all ages. And she's also from Puerto Rico. I mean, I think that's pretty obvious. <laughs> <laughs> so super happy to be here. We are both from La Yupi, which is the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras. Super happy to represent. And she's also, uh, as part of her education, she has a doctorate in um, from the from college Ca uh, Cambridge College UMass Boston UMass Boston, U UMass Boston and also um, from Cambridge College as an honoris eh, causa which is pretty amazing and from UMass like she said in public policy, policy. so those are those are her studies uh, after La UP I'm pretty sure La UP was more fun right, right. <laughs> awesome and also, um, eh, Inclinos en Acción, eh, there, she has been um, from 2003, so you have been, based on that, you have been in Boston for a while. I've only been through two years. For me, I haven't, like, the cold is too much for me, so hopefully you have tips and, like, maybe your wardrobe, like a good coat. <laughs> I need it. Um, but, yeah, tell us a little bit about your experience. Is there anything that I missed that people should know before we, you know, keep talking? <laughs> well, buenas noches todos. Good evening. First of all, I'm super impressed that uh, Will Maddie's had such a wonderful command of my journey here and my bio uh, without reading it. So thank you so much. Thank you to the Chamber and City Awake for inviting me tonight. Uh, when I got the call and would you want to be part of Words of Wisdom, it's like, well, I'm always seeking for wisdom. So imparting it is different, but yes, of course, you know, whatever I've learned, I'm happy to share and I'm happy to learn more. So I hope that this would be an exchange. But as Jessica mentioned, I'm originally from Puerto Rico, from San Juan. I uh, went to the UP and the UP or the University of Puerto Rico, but we call it in Puerto Rico, La Yupi, uh, was very, very important <laughs> in my formative years as a professional and as an adult, where I really became very active in a number of uh, programs, clubs, 
the student council, political activism, and really looking for opportunities to engage communities, low-income communities and marginalized communities. So that has been part of my journey that has come even before the UPR, because uh, my family, especially my mom, really instilled in me this value of you know always being grateful for what you are and uh, feeling that sense of privilege for what we have, and then paying it forward and giving back both things. So that has really been a defining uh, value for me in my journey to get here. But I moved to Boston as a graduate student. Uh, and mm, I don't, still don't like, after 30 years here, I still struggle with the winter and the wardrobe and the shoes okay. and the boots and everything that comes with it and the shoveling yeah, all so of there's that. nothing to do about that there's then. there's no easy way around <laughs> it um, but i came here not with the intention of staying i came here as a graduate student thinking okay as soon as i finish i go back uh, at the time i was uh, in conversations with the university of puerto, of puerto rico but the medical sciences campus to go back after i completed my phd but Life takes different turns, and here I am, uh, 30 years later. So of those years, uh, soon after I arrived to Boston, many people say, oh, where's your accent from? Because if you haven't noticed, I do have one. <laughs> I'm sure you have. Um, Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always say that and you, we all should be proud of our accents because it's just proof that you're fluent in another language, at least one more language, oh. right? So we all own it and be proud of it, because that's what it is. And if you are an English speaker and speak another language with an accent, be proud of it too, because you uh, are bilingual or trilingual or quite trilingual, whatever the case might be. Anyway, when I got here, people said, oh, where are you from? So I'm from Puerto Rico, and immediately people pointed me out to Villa Victoria, which is the affordable housing community owned by IBA, Inquilinos Puericos en Acción. And so you have to go there. There's a strong Puerto Rican community, etc. And indeed, when I finally made my way to Villa Victoria, I remember one of my first memories walking down around the streets. It's like the smell coming out of the housing, you know, the apartments, you know, that smell like my abuela's cooking, my mom's cooking. It's like, oh my God, yes, it feels like home. home. And then I started attending some of the cultural events that IBA uh, has done for many years. So let me tell you briefly about IBA. IBA is a community development corporation, uh, which was founded in 1968 by Puerto Rican activists. Hence our name, Inquilinos Boricuas en Acción, or Puerto Rican Tenants in Action. The, uh, the Puerto Rican community at the time that lived in the South End, where we are located, uh, fought for uh, the plans that the city had at the time for uh, urban renewal, which would have meant that they were going to be displaced, moved, you know, pushed out of their neighborhood. So they fought back and created IBA in 1968 as the institution, the organization that would stop the city plans for redevelopment and develop their own plans based on the uh, community's vision to revitalize the neighborhood, to develop housing that was affordable, safe, and decent. Because uh, at the time, many of the homes or their apartments were owned by slumlords. Uh, so they said, no, we're going to develop the housing. And along with the housing, we will develop community programs and services to make the community vibrant and safe. So if we fast forward now 55 years next year, we have continued that legacy and that work in developing and preserving affordable housing. I'm sure that all of you, young and old, know and have felt at some point in your lives the crunch of housing and how expensive housing is in this city and it's in this region. So we continue to do the work of developing and preserving affordable housing combined with programs that uh, include a bilingual preschool program, youth development programs, financial empowerment programs, residence services, and arts. And sometimes people say, like, why a community development corporation is doing arts programming? And that was part of our founders' 
vision. They were so visionary and they always felt that the arts were an important instrument or a tool to develop community, to build community, to build, bring people together and to make community safe, vibrant, thriving, as well as to honor our heritage and our history and roots. So that's what IBA does and in fact that work is so impactful that IBA is a national model for community development and, and combining housing with all these other programs. Amazing. I mean, you yes, said a lot. I mean, it is pretty important work. So let's give it an applause. <laughs> awesome. I mean, a lot of things came to mind um, when you were talking. Um, but I was wondering about that last part about the arts. And maybe can you give us an example about what are those kind of like art projects or like education opportunities a little bit more. Can you elaborate on like, what are those opportunities that people can um, you know, have because of, of th thanks for the, the uh, organization. Yeah. Absolutely, so as I mentioned, arts has been very important for making our community safer, more vibrant, more inclusive, uh, more um, he healthier right, because people feel engaged, they come out, and part of that is doing a lot of events, especially in the summertime, uh, that brings people out to, our, to the community. Not only our neighbors and our residents out, but being people from outside the community in. So we create this wonderful synergy. And the uh, flex, you know, the flagship event for EBA every year is Festival de Tances which happens every year, the third weekend in July. Check it out next July. Put it in your calendar. So I will. So I've never been. Fun I heard event. of it, but I didn't go because I, I went to Puerto Rico. <laughs> so if you're in town, the third weekend in July, come. I guarantee you have a great time. Food, music, culture, uh, vendors, and community, which is the most important piece of Festival de Tances. So that's one example. We do have uh, events throughout the city in the summer, the Tito Puente Latin Music Series. We are, for example, this week we are opening an arts event at Cambridge College, uh, a gallery exhibit, really, of this wonderful Puerto Rican artist called, uh, well, the artist is called Bernardo, and his name is Bernardo Medina, but his work is called Sofrito Manifesto, and he's honoring his abuela's cooking through a cookbook that he made with their recipes that is more like a coffee table book because it's more about the photographs of the food. And then he took those photographs and it's this wonderful exhibit that I invited to you all to come. You can check it out in Eva's uh, website, evaboston.org, or following us or on you know, social media, you'll find more information about the exhibit. But that's you know, ways in which arts bring people out, uh, real community, we share our heritage, our roots, our culture, our food, like we're doing tonight. And in terms of education, we integrate the arts in every aspect of the work that IBA does. So our youth development program, for example, and we have members of our IBA team here, Pedro, our, develop, our director of youth development, Rafael, chief program officer, Patricia, HR, Jahaira, our Director of Resident Services, Tara, our direct Chief Development Officer, and Chris, our Executive Assistant. All of this great team with others help really move this mission forward. And in education, particularly in the youth program, we make sure that young people after school and during the summer have academic opportunities using the arts as that vehicle to engage them, to help them think critically, to really think about civic engagement and participation. What are the community challenges that they want to tackle and how do they do that through arts? Like the last cycle, last school year, they all recognized that mental health, for example, was a big issue after the pandemic. And I think all of us have heard that and have experienced that either ourselves or through loved ones uh, or you know significant others so they started thinking about mental health and created arts projects and postcards to really talk about that and researched it and brought and created um, uh, like a toolbox 
for families and young people to really demystify mental health challenges and seek out help. So things like that, it's really a great creative, innovative work that this team and others really help us put together to accomplish our mission. Awesome, um, that's really great. It sounds like great opportunities are given, um, thanks to you guys, and you guys had a nice shout out. Everybody yeah. follow them on LinkedIn later. Yes, <laughs> please. <laughs> Um, yeah, but you did mention the pandemic, so I feel like I should touch on it right now. Because, I mean, for sure, there were a lot of discrepancies, and majorly in minority communities, like African communities and Hispanic communities. How do you think, um, you know, your organization, and being the front woman, like, how was it, like, a little bit overwhelming for you guys? Like, how do you guys handle that, um, you know, in the crisis? For everybody, even ourselves, uh, are, like, what is happening right now? Definitely. I, ha I have to say, and not because they're here, because if they weren't here, I would say it anyway. But one of the best um, things about EVA is its people, the, the talent, the people that work at EVA, the enormous uh, commitment, dedication, and hard work that they show every day. And, you know, and that's every normal day. Forget about pandemic days. Just mm -hmm. day in, day out. So that, during the pandemic, came through loud and clear. Uh, our team really pivoted all of our programs on how are we going to support our families. Because we knew that the families that EBA serves were the family that, families that were the most impacted by the pandemic. So even before we were about to close, I called Rafael, our chief program officer, and it's like, we need to check uh, what's the, our team's ability to connect digitally? What, what, mm -hmm. what are their needs? Because we're gonna close down for two weeks. Like everyone thought two weeks was the wow. shutdown. Uh, <laughs> and it was almost close to two years at the end. Wow. Uh, and That's then we started- optimistic mindset, I gotta say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we missed the mark. But, uh, but everyone thought it was gonna be two weeks. Right, But we said, okay, what are the needs? And then how do we connect with the community? And I said, well, I think we need to do a quick wellness uh, check with our community in four areas, health. You know, are they getting COVID? Are they getting sick? Can they access prescriptions? Can they access healthcare, et cetera, so health. Um, Financial stability, have they lost their jobs, their wages? Can they access unemployment? What are, what are their needs? Uh, food security, can they access food? And lastly, and I thought it was, this one's gonna be, I thought we have to include it, but it's probably the least important one, digital access. So we made really, I don't know, very few questions on each one, like two, three questions per area, because we it was just wellness calls. And thanks to Resident Services and the team, we started calling uh, our community, our families, and we found that there were needs in each one of those areas and very high digital divide. You know, families who had phones but didn't have computers or had computers but didn't have strong broadband or Wi-Fi access. That, so there were a number of needs and we immediately started figuring out, okay, what are, how can we access those needs? Where do we get food to bring? We did in one year about 40 weekly distributions of food. We access funds to bring uh, digital access to the community. We had uh, vaccine clinics before vaccines were available, a few weeks before they were available to the public in our community. We created learning pods, and that was a big lift. Uh, that I remember when I mentioned this to Rafael, he was looking at me like, is she crazy? <laughs> <laughs> well, we pulled that off. We had learning pods for children in our community and for our youth uh, during the school year that was virtual, so they could learn in a space that were supported, where they had additional supports, and they weren't home. Uh, struggling. So uh, a lot of things. I mean, just those are headlines of the many, many things that we did. We did a lot of uh, information and education uh, programs, uh, helping our community understand what COVID-19 was, how you would 
you know, how could you prevent it? We did distributions of PPE, I mean, you name it. Everything that we had our reach to keep our community safe and healthy. That's great. It sounds like you guys weren't prepared, but it sounds like you were prepared to take, um, you know, overcome all of that, and you were creative. We've been learning pods. That sounds great. How yeah. did that work? Can you talk about that a little bit more? Sure. Uh, so we uh, partnered with three other community organizations, uh, the YMCA of Greater Boston, the BASE, and Latinos for Education, to, bring, to create uh, community pods across the city. And we created one right in the South End, in which uh, kids from our community went there every day during the school year. You know, that would have been school year 2020 to 2021, uh, right? Yes, 2020 to 2021. Uh, it feels like so far ago, but it was the school, that school year. So we had programming from about 8 a.m. to 3 4 p.m. And what we did is that we divided a huge space into smaller pods per age, per age group, like kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth, sixth, sixth grade. And kids would sit with a teacher, so we had to hire people. We had to hire teachers that were from the community, most of them. Uh, so they would look like our, our kids. And they were, throughout the day, uh, connected to a laptop, a Chromebook, to their class, right? So through their own teacher in their classroom, but then our teachers there were supporting them, making sure that they were paying attention, that they were following through with the homework, that they also had enrichment activities, that they have breakfast, lunch, and snacks. Nice. So, there, so there was engagement also that gave opportunities for parents who had to work. Many of our parents had to work because they were frontline workers could go to work and work. So that's with the younger kids. With the older kids, the teenagers, we created them uh, virtual learning pods in which they connected in their homes to their classrooms. But in the afternoons, our team were sitting with them, supporting them. Okay, where are you with the homework? Supporting them uh, with uh, behavioral support, right? As well as academic support and arts. Uh, and having some uh, in-person meetings in between to check in, giving them like goodie bags, uh, helping them connect to uh, food um, programs, et cetera. So there was you know, two different strategies for younger and older kids, but something that we created, you know, Oh, yeah, that's right out great. that, that like a summer. Very impactful work. I do remember a lot of people were like, I mean, how can my son study if we don't have even a computer? Yeah. And it's, I mean, today that's like a first necessity, and it's kind of weird to think about that, but that's reality. So it's good that you guys were able to support in the way that you could. I mean, you guys were basically a, well, a school. Yeah, for, we for became those a kids. school. For so that's, that's absolutely. Awesome. Um, so. Thinking about your journey, because you, you have been in that position since 2003, what maybe you have like moments that you remember, like your favorite moments, or like what do you like most about working there and being like the front woman of of Iba? Front woman. Woo. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Latina power. <laughs> you, you heard that. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it's definitely uh, a journey when I. I as you heard earlier, I came here to do a PhD. So as I was completing my PhD and after I finished, uh, I went into that traditional academic track, right? Uh, in which I was doing a lot of research, uh, in my case, policy research and health policy research. Uh, I was at the, right before I came to EBA, I was at Brandeis University at the Heller School working with incredible people doing research on health disparities and particularly in cancer disparities as it's always been my interest in supporting uh, initiatives, research work, programs, practices, and policies that uplift uh, communities of color. Um, so I was doing great work. I was doing, I was teaching at the School of Social Work at Boston University. So I was in that kind of academic track trying to figure out what was I going to do next. 
However, I knew Eva already, and I loved Eva because I had come to all the events, and I had rented their art space for uh, other private events, and I had done a, a couple of small consulting projects for Eva, and the opportunity to work at Eva opened up as, at the time, director of operations was the position. And I was offered the position, and you know, I had, to, I struggled with the decision because for me, it was a detour from the path that I was trying to carve myself out in academia and research, you know, publishing and all that good stuff. Um, but I had this void about, you know, um, working with communities and really translating, translating research and policy into practice and community work. So I really strongly started considering it. But then I talked to different people and, you know, I got all of, all sorts of, you know, reviews in terms of mixed reviews. So, yes, you should do it. It's like, are you crazy? Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, I spent a good amount of time, hours, nights, <laughs> conversations, <laughs> <laughs> uh, especially with my husband as to whether or not I was going to accept the position. At the end, I did. And I have to tell you, I've never looked back. And it was one of the best decisions I've ever made because it has given me not only the opportunity to do work that I'm passionate about, that I love, but also opportunities to amplify and uplift the voices of my community and the community that I so proudly serve. So I uh, have been you know, really privileged and, and blessed to have this opportunity and not being shy to use my soapbox every time I can to really bring forward the challenges and great opportunities that exist in our community. So I'm really happy to be able to do that and, you know, Obviously, as a woman and a woman of color, a Latina, I have had challenges to overcome, to, to make my way to where I want to be. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, uh, when I was much younger, really r surrounding myself with people who are uh, like-minded, first of all. Second of all, people who definitely believed in me. Uh, third, um, saying yes, like you, you're doing. And I very much applaud that of you. You know, it's like, there's an opportunity. Sign me up. I, you know, and I, my, my kids are now older, but at the time, there were, I had two young kids at home. And only my husband and I to raise them because all of our families were, were not here. But I have also a very supportive husband that said, like, yeah, do it. And it's like, oh, I want to do this. Do it. Nice. And we would. Si, sí, mi amor. We would. Si, sí, mi amor. Si, sí, lo que tú digas. <laughs> and, uh, and so oh, we mi would, papa. My dad know, is like that as well. <laughs> yeah. And then we would share our responsibility of raising our kids, right? So I could be in events like this or do whatever but also be home for, for my kids as well. So we would be able, I was able to balance that. That didn't make it easy. It was not easy. Uh, and oftentimes I had to sacrifice one or the other. Um, so those are things that you have to keep in perspective as, you know, as a young professional thinking about your future. But to the extent that you can step into spaces, that you can say yes, that you can volunteer, that you can say, I want to be part of this, you should. I sit in a number of very prominent boards right now. But when I started, I would sit in the community center board. And right there in Villa Victoria. Yeah, that's a start. Yeah, it's a start. Yeah, I want to, and I didn't do it because, oh, I want to be on a board. No, because I figured there are opportunities there, opportunities for the community. And then you jump in and the rest happens, right? You have to work hard. And if you commit, you commit. It's not just I'm in a board to say I'm in a board and then I sh don't show up. Uh, but it's really kind of stepping into sometimes uncomfortable spaces and making it work. Awesome. Good intel. <laughs> um, to touch base a little bit more on the Hispanic heritage, a little bit more, even back Puerto Rico, 
you're doing such impactful work here for those people and others, not necessarily Hispanic, I'm sure. How do you feel still connected doing this type of work here? Like, do you think back home, like, hey, I'm sure a lot of people are like in the same struggle. Yeah. Like, what is your perspective on that? Do you have like connections back home that you're like also affiliated and you're also like supporting from here while you can? Yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> yes, um, we have over the years, especially because Eva is such a model for community development, and we have been studied by scholars. Uh, you know, people from Harvard has, have come to study the Eva model, but also people from you know other parts of the world, and certainly from Puerto Rico. So we have collaborated uh, with Puerto Rico in different initiatives over the course of the last 55 years. But more recently, especially five years ago, after Hurricane Maria happened, uh, we stepped again into it. Um, we And that's one thing that you see Eva's trajectory, a lot of innovation, a lot of stepping into it, you know, just do it, right? There's a need to step into it and, uh, you know, kind of branch out, stretch our capacity to make whole, make communities whole. So five years ago, after Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, we were like, oh, what can we do? And the main reaction for many people was like, oh, this collect things and send there. Let's collect water or diapers or food or rice or whatever it was. Uh, and I f felt that those were important efforts, but I didn't feel that Eva should do that because first, other people were doing it. We don't need to reinvent the wheel or duplicate efforts, right? Let's just amplify and complement, not duplicate. So that's one piece. And secondly, the destruction after Hurricane Maria was such that it was hard to then get things down. And then it was hard to distribute them when you get them down. So I said, why don't we collect money and send it down to organizations that are doing the work right there? So a group of us uh, organized a, a meeting at EBA literally a week or five days after the hurricane. And we put it on Facebook, we invited everyone, we we're gonna do a Facebook Live. We thought that maybe 50 people would show up, over 200 people showed up in a space about this big. And there was people, you know, on Facebook Live, like outside <laughs> because they couldn't get in, trying to figure out how we're gonna do. Uh, and uh, after that, the result, that night we said, okay, let's raise money. And we said, okay, let's raise, I don't know, 50,000? Someone said, no, 100,000. So, okay. And then former uh, state representative, representative Jeffrey Sanchez, who was there that night, said, like, that's too small. Let's do a million dollars. And <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. And, you know, Eva's going to raise a million dollars, and then we're going to send it to Puerto Rico. I, I'm thinking, how the hell are we yeah, going to do we that? <laughs> yeah, but okay, let's do it. So it turns out that then the Boston Foundation offered to support that effort and to help us raise money and to then be the conduit to uh, send the money to Puerto Rico because Eva's not a foundation, so we have our limitations. Uh, and at the end, we raised $4 million to send to Puerto Rico. More than one uh, million. More than one million, yes. That's awesome. And, uh, so that was really great, and then there were families that were displaced, obviously, uh, after the hurricane, and we helped many of those families access services when they came here, and many of them find housing, and some of them are living now in our community in Villa Victoria. So that was a very strong effort. And more recently, with Fiona, mm -hmm. you know, five Every years year later, yeah, it's climate change, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to be facing these super storms, many of these super storms every year in different parts of the Caribbean, not only Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, but Cuba, Jamaica, Florida, Texas, Alabama, North Carolina, etc. Um, so more recently, after Fiona, uh, Hurricane Fiona, Point 32 Health Foundation, uh, offer to match 
uh, $50,000 to uh, efforts to raise money. So we are in that fundraising effort. I invited you all to talk to me at the end and uh, do your contribution, whatever you can, as we're hoping to send $100,000 to Puerto Rico this time around. Uh, and those dollars, every penny, there's, it's really a pass through. Nothing stays in Massachusetts. Every penny goes down to the island, to organizations that are nonprofits that are doing work uh, at the base uh, right in the community. No, a very important work. Uh, I was there when the Hurricane Maria happened, and I, you know, we we're not able to contact people in the U.S. for days and days, and it's hard because I, I, I am really blessed. Like we had power, like before a lot of people. I mean, there's people, there's people that still don't have power. They had to move from their houses. Um, but it's great that you know, I think that was a smart approach. Like, just send the money. Have them like make sure that the resources get there because if if you're from Puerto Rico and you saw the news, like some of the resources didn't get to the people, which is very disappointing. So it's good that you guys like have a good strategy to make sure that um, it was happening. Right, and clearly non-government NGOs, right, nonprofit organizations, nothing affiliated with the government. We wanted to send it right yeah, into probably the because of that. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, going back. Because um, you did mention that one of the obstacles for you, or like, it was an obstacle that you were a Latina. Why do you think it was an obstacle, and do you see it as an asset as well? Like, which one goes more than the other? It's always an ice. I'm a class half full uh, thinker, so uh, I always see opportunities when there, you know, there seem not <laughs> like none. Um, but yeah, obviously there are challenges uh, to establish yourself, especially if you are not, you know, someone who belongs to the, the dominant mainstream community. Uh, things like I felt dismissed at meetings, like my opinion didn't matter, I felt ignored, I felt, you know, like I was not good enough. I felt imposter syndrome. I still do from time to time. Um, you know, all those things that go through your mind that you struggle with, as, as, and for me particularly, I'm not going to speak for anyone here, but for me as a woman and a woman of color, really being in a meeting and providing uh, an idea that I thought was genial, <laughs> a wonderful, you know, an idea, and then no one is dismissed and literally 10 minutes later someone else most likely a white male no offense to white males here would say the same thing and people will latch on and it's like wait what happened yo did just... you hear me <laughs> Wait, uh, I was, on, was I on mute? <laughs> that was before the pandemic. It's like, was I on mute? Um, so things like that, you know, things like, uh, you know, asking me about my accent in a way that felt disrespectful because I do have an accent. So if you ask me, oh, where's your accent from? I don't take offense, but, you know, there's ways and there are ways. Mm -hmm. So things like that, you know, in which I felt, hmm, you know, it's, this doesn't feel comfortable. And, you know, sometimes, and you, I, in my case, I learned, at the, sometimes at the beginning I would shy away, like, go home and feel like, ah, oh, that felt ugly. And then you start learning, like, oh, I'm not going to let this slide. I'm going to educate. <laughs> this is my opportunity <laughs> to help others understand where I'm from and what I have to offer. Uh, but it took me a while to get there because obviously at the beginning you feel like, hi, okay, I don't belong, so why should I be, you know, okay, let me go home and cry it out, and which I did uh, at some point. But I said, like, no, this is not sustainable, and I, I'm proud of who I am. I wear it on my sleeve, I have nothing to hide, you know. I'm proud of my family, I'm proud of my roots, my upbringing, my language, my music, my culture, my food, nice. everything. Ooh. So I don't need to squash it. 
So let me educate others. And if they want to be educated, fine. If not, let them be ignorant. Okay? I'm going to keep doing what I need to do. Um, yeah. I know I agree, and I'm going to follow that advice for sure. Yes, please, <laughs> everyone here. And even, you know, it, and this applies to everything, right? We all have different intersex intersectionalities, right? You may be a white woman. You may be a white gay man. I, I don't know. Yeah. There's so We all carry our own identities, and we should wear them proud. That makes us who we are, and we should help others understand the beauty in that. Awesome, well said, well said. I, I agree with that. <laughs> um, so something that came to mind, because I that this happened to me, so I just want to see what, what are your thoughts on this. Because um, you, when you got the EVA opportunity, you were a little unsure about that. And I mean, I wasn't sure, but I'm thinking about more like when I was in um, college and university, I was one of those people that didn't know what to study. Like I, start, I started in accounting and I was like, oh no, like what should I do? And my parents were like, what do you mean you're changing majors? Like what is technology? Like, and like, what is your advice as somebody, you know, with experience that was kind of in that position of like, my future is gonna change because of this decision, like, and it's gonna be uncertain. Like, what is your advice to young professionals, and even like young people that are in the university, like in my case, um, you know, like, what to do next? Like, what do we, should we do what the gut tells you? Yeah. <laughs> Great question, because I was there, way before I made the decision to uh, join EBA. Uh, when I was in La Yupi, mm -hmm. uh, actually my bachelor's degree is in education. And my first job out of college was a th as a third grade teacher in a public school in Rio Piedras, Puerto Rico, in nice. La Avenida Gandara. You developed a lot of patience, I'm sure, with that, I, <laughs> with <yeah>. that one. <laughs> uh, uh, probably not, because I took, you know, I said like, no, I'm not gonna do this for a living. So I don't know if, I had patience at the time, but I, realized that I it's more have developed the it's to more developing right. keep it going <laughs> um, but yeah I, I think you know and this is advice that I even give to my sons right sometimes when you know decisions are hard you know many decisions not every decision you know like when am I gonna work today that's an easy decision okay don't don't sweat it over but um, other decisions especially around your career your family are hard decisions because a lot is at stake. Uh, and I think for me in particular in that decision, uh, you have to really, because at, at the end, I, this is my math, right? At the end when I made the decision to join EVA, it's like, okay, I, I think I'm gonna love this. I love this organization. I love this community. I love this work. I love the vision. I love the history. So I'm gonna do it. And you know, if in one year or two it doesn't work out, then you know I'll go back, or I figure out something else. Uh, so, in my case, luckily, it's been you know uh, um, un apostolado, casi <laughs> an apostolate, right? It's something that I really am passionate and I love doing. But in the worst case scenario, I would have said, okay, this is not for me. Let, let me rethink what's next. So. Oftentimes, you have to just take the risk, make the jump, and assess it. And hopefully, it will work out. And if it doesn't, it's not the end of the world. There are opportunities there. Make sure you surround yourself with mentors, sponsors, people who support you, good partners like my husband. Don't take him. He's taken. <laughs> but, you know, someone like him <laughs> or like her, whatever, you, so, you know, a good partner that will support you. Uh, and make, make good decisions, people. And make, yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, you, you, sometimes you have to, to take the risk and make the jump. That's awesome. Um, and what about, I just thought about this right now. You did say earlier that the person that started the organization was Boricua. What do you think they would say to you like right now? Wow, that's a great question. Yeah, it was a, a group of Puerto Rican activists. And actually, I have had over the years the honor 
to meet many of them. Some of them have already passed. Uh, and I, you know, I just hope that they'll be proud. Proud of me, proud of the work, proud of the community, proud of the team. Uh, and, and see still to do, because it's not over. Uh, and how proud they are that we are in the trenches still doing this great work. Um, so, yeah, I hope they'll be proud. Awesome. That's nice. That's great. Okay, so we're, we're going to be wrapping up soon. <laughs> but I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions. So we're excited about those. Who wants to get started? Don't be shy. <laughs> Yeah, over, over my time at EBA, uh, which has been really my opportunity to develop, fully develop as a leader. Uh, before I, I, was, I came to EBA, I was doing a lot of interesting work and kind of taking leadership roles because I've always had a, I think, you know, the term, I know you all know the term FOMO. <laughs> I think I coined that term before it was that term. Uh, I'm always like, oh, I don't want to miss that. Oh, I, don't want, I have to say this. Oh, yes, what I what is to... FOMO? I don't know. Oh, FOMO? Fear of missing out. Mm, I haven't heard that long, I guess. <laughs> Fear of missing out. FOMO. So I think I coined the term before. The term was even a term. Um, but I, you know, since I've been at EBA, which has been the... the the longest part of my career and where I have, able, I have been able to really develop as a leader and bring others along with me. Um, there have been a number of setbacks, you know, nothing is rosy and moments in which I said, is this worth it? Uh, you know, number of times like that. And so I can give, I can be here a long time talking about different examples, but I'll give you one more specific, which was early on during my time at EBA. Um, the EBA went through a very radical overnight transition shortly after I joined, which threw the organization to a spin, and it was very unstable financially, um, organizationally. Um, it was very hard. I, sometimes I was like, oh my God, are we going to have, I, I, can we make payroll this week? It was that it was that difficult, and I have to say that we're now the largest Latino-led nonprofit in Eastern Massachusetts. So it's been a really great journey to get here. But at that at that beginning, um, obviously, I needed to make really hard decisions, and I really to uh, needed to engage a number of people. I was kind of the new kid on the block because I was coming from academia, so people in the philanthropic world and in the community development world and nonprofit world didn't really know who Vanessa was. Who is Vanessa? <laughs> and quién uh, está? <laughs> and uh, so I had to really kind of introduce myself, sit at these tables and really present the transition plan and how I was thinking to help turn around the organization, et cetera. And oftentimes I got the door shut on me. Uh, and that was very hard. That was very hard. But definitely what I learned from it is like you don't give up and you have to say, okay, well, what, what, what part of what I was selling they didn't buy? <laughs> what, what part I wasn't clear, what they didn't understand? How can I improve that for the next person? Well, to go back to them and see if I can change their minds, but if not to the next funder, to the next lender, to the next person, to the next potential board member. Um, and uh, so taking all that, you know, that, that hardship, that, and not trying not to take it personal and really say, okay, 
what is that I need to change to really help people understand the importance of this organization, the importance of our mission, and the importance of them investing in it and in us. So that, that was one of the areas. There are others, but that one, especially because it was so early in my journey at EVA and my leadership development, uh, that it was very hard, and I, I learned a lot from it. I think also it helped me being humble about, because, you know, you think you're going, you know, going to change the world, but being humble about it and really be reflective about the opportunities and thinking, look at this, look at this, I mean, mama, you know, when a door closes, another one opens, that it sounds so cliche, but it really is true. You know, you just have to work hard and really reflect on why did that door close and how you can make the other one stay open for you. Absolutely. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Well, I'm afraid to say that we want to expand in front of my team here because <laughs> they lynched me on the way to the car. Because <laughs> every time I come up with an idea, it's like, oh my God, there she comes again. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. But anyway, uh, we're ready. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, uh, we actually, uh, about two weeks ago, our board of directors just. Uh, uh, approved our five-year strategic plan. I knew, you know, we have every five years we refresh our, our strategy and really think about what are things that we can stop doing, do better, or do more of. And as part of the five-year plan, we have some expansion uh, plans. Not geographic expansion, though. But we have really excited, I'm really excited about this plan. We are looking into uh, in first building a beautiful new CASA for EVA, and the CASA is the Center for Arts, Self-Determination, and Activism. So a new building for EVA that will house all of our programs and will allow us to develop more affordable housing in existing uh, buildings that we have. So that's really, truly exciting. So it's part of that expansion. And another big important part of that expansion is really helping our families close the wealth gap. Uh, that stubborn wealth gap. We have identified families uh, that are ready to become homeowners and we are going to double down on programs and uh, opportunities for them to become homeowners as we know that homeownership is the premier, <laughs> the biggest way uh, for families to build wealth and especially intergenerational wealth. Uh, so we're very excited about expanding <laughs> that way, <laughs> but it's that geographic expansion, however, uh, unfortunately. We have talked about it, uh, but I guess it might be the following the five years. Who oh, no. Berlin. Uh, <laughs> at, at some point. But in terms of success, I would say uh, different things because, you know, I, I, I'm somewhat familiar with the city of Lynn. Great work happening there. 
a lot of displacement, some good organizations. Uh, I think in terms of uh, success, it's really not only the leadership of the, of the organization, but it's the organization really finding committed people. Because I'm here talking to Will Maddox today, but oftentimes I get the accolades and all the awards from the chamber who honor me with the Distinguished Bostonian earlier this year. What a wonderful honor. But the day-to-day -day work is done by these people and others, right, who are really committed. So really finding people who take the mission of the organization as part of their life mission. I think it's important. And we're always happy to share uh, ideas, to share uh, mm -hmm. ideas on programs and opportunities for others to continue to thrive. Because if we could be, if we could have an EBA in each of the 370 towns in Massachusetts, we would, but I don't think that's gonna happen anytime soon, so we're happy to share what we know and what we've learned for others to be as successful. So we can definitely connect. Por supuesto. One more, or anybody, one more? No. <laughs> otra, otra. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you, and thank you all so much for coming out. Um, it's so interesting. I think one thing that really resonated with me for today is um, when you asked about that expansion plan and your team was like, we're ready, that's how you know true leadership is here, right? Aha! Uh -huh. Now they're on record. <laughs> um, but that is just so inspiring, the movement that you have um, in our community. Um, one thing also that resonated with me is like your... Um, take on like how you still have imposter syndrome, but it's the mission and the impact in the work that we're doing that's just driving us to push beyond our limit our own limitations, you know? So I really appreciate that reflection.